Cindy Gomez Shemp. And Duke Gomez Shemp. You're listening to 88.1 FM, KPPPLP, Fargo, Moorhead, where we are adding local color to your airwave. And tonight we have Oscar El Blue Ramirez, and we're going to be talking about border breaches right there in Tijuana, what he's been experiencing. Um, he's had uh, recent visits from Mr. Berkwam, from Mr. Agüero, and from Paloma. And he will be giving us some insight on what's been going on with a human smuggler that was confronted at the Agape Shelter in Tijuana, Baja California. Uh, we'll be also talking quickly about a, a shelter that is not a shelter, that's very close to the border wall in Playas de Tijuana. Um, we'll also be talking about who is supporting, what organizations are supporting that shelter from the Caravan Support Network, Border Support Network, and the San Diego Rapid Response Network. Uh, Oscar has some interesting insights into what's really happening with all these border breaches and how they may be uh, used as smoke screens. So uh, you also had some encounters with Antifa. Why don't you start off telling us, Oscar, what really happened with this uh, human smuggling situation? They won't hear him unless it's how you doing, everybody? How's everybody doing? I'm sorry for, uh, you know, I must apologize to every, uh, you know, fan of Cindy and Duke. We're doing this, you know, this way. Why? Because I had a problem with Skype. And uh, I'm sorry. So, so hi to everybody over there in Minnesota. Uh, yes, you know, uh, around 4 o'clock in the morning, I received a text. Around 4 or something, something in the morning, I received a text uh, to uh, from Padre Al, uh, Pastor Alberto, I'm sorry, from the shelter Agape. And uh, his uh, text was uh, uh, pretty, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, unfortunate that the number one person that he trusted over there in his shelter, that is, uh, uh, that is a security guard, that he is an immigrant, uh, you know, trying to uh, move over here on the north. He's from Guatemala. This guy is the one in charge of smuggling immigrants and connecting the smuggling through connections or this organizations from America and some people from Mexico. This guy, this Guatemala guy, that it was the security guy for the Agape Shelter. Uh, now he is the one that has been smuggling. And how did everybody you know know about that he was smuggling? The number one thing and the number one reason why it was because a lot of immigrants started to complain with the pastor and saying to them. You know, we got three minors that they're not coming back home yet. They didn't come, they didn't came back home to the shelter. They were asking, where are they? So the pastor started asking everybody and they, you know, everybody started opening up. They were afraid of being opened up. Apparently this security guy, uh, you know, from Guatemala, he's been operating this uh, illegal trafficking and this uh, kidnapping apparently for more than four to five months. And it's amazing, it's amazing how the liberty that he's been getting and how these organizations and how this all these, you know, people that they've been working with them, uh, they have the freedom to do whatever the hell they want. Uh, and uh, apparently the, the last uh, movement that he was doing, he took uh, 10 people. Out of 10 people, seven were adults and three of them were minors. Apparently this, this is what happened and this is what I get by the pastor. Uh, this, is the, the, this is the uh, image that the. Um, this is the uh, picture that you sent me. The gentleman in the picture that you sent me. Duke will put it up here in a in a minute. Uh, that's the child. That's the minor. We have another. This is the picture of one of the minor children that was missing. But this is the image of the gentleman that you sent me, right? Yes, the one that is like in an ID. Right. That's the gentleman that is accused of uh, smuggling people. That is a gentleman that is accused of smuggling right now, and the pastor is going to put kidnapping, too. Uh, apparently, what happened was that this guy took the 10 of them. He took them to a private hotel in Playa de Tijuana, and one of the minors, uh, he, he uh, apparently, they locked him up in the bathroom because he wasn't, you know, feeling comfortable about the whole situation. So he started yelling, making a big noise, and, and uh, they moved all the other nine people. They left only that minor there he he uh he managed to escape 
He went to the front desk of the hotel. He made contact with the authorities, and he was asking to, uh, you know, uh, to contact him with some family members over in Honduras. He asked for 7,000 pesos to get back to his country. Uh, it was delivered, the 7,000. He, uh, you know, he surrendered himself to the Institutional National of Immigration, and they, he's moving now on, uh, to, on the way back to his country. Okay. So, Oscar, um, can tell us about the um, unaccompanied minor, the, y the young lady that is missing now. This is this is the thing that it, it's, you know, Cindy, it's exhausting. It's exhausting and it's draining and it's draining me up, but I keep fighting the good fight. It's exhausting to keep seeing these kind of things in our government is not doing anything about it. It's exhausting that the United States only has one border patrol and it's exhausting. All these things, you know, it's exhausting. And when I was hearing the pastor talk, I was like, man, we are so tired of seeing all these situations coming about every weekend exactly the same thing and what happened was that it's only two minors that they are that they are that they're missing you got two minors that they're missing and this guy you know he had the audacity after all these events that happened late late at night he came back to the shelter and uh he was wait the, the, the immigrants and the pastor they were waiting for him to confront him there's a video that I uploaded on my page that is, uh, you know, you can watch that. And, you know, apparently people are talking to him, but the pastor didn't record the whole video. And the, he told me, you know, that, that the video is supposed to be of people confronting him and telling him and minors telling him, yes, you were the one that they was offering us to go back to if you wanted to cross illegally to the United States by the amount of five hundred dollars for each person. Now. The pastor, I, would, I asked him, is by any chance this guy collided with, you know, Caravan Support Network and the, you know, River Doherty character and all this stuff? And he was he was hesitating to tell me, but you know what? He, he was pretty honest. He told me, you know, they had a really good relationship when he was over here. So, uh, you know, the rumor is that he is collided with this all these organizations that they are from America, and this is the way they're working, Sydney. They're renting, they're renting rooms, they're renting, uh, 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 you know, Airbnbs, they're renting private hotels. This is the way the organizations from America are working. The smugglers over here in Tijuana, they, that is not the way they work. They work really differently. And this is a total different scenario of how trafficking is doing and have, how it's happening over here in Tijuana. After that, this smuggler that he was confronted uh, by all the immigrants that they're coming from Central America in the pastor's office. He left. He tried to leave, and he was arrested by the police department. Now, get this. They took him the, to the police station, and the pastor was, you know, the, the, the police officer told the pastor, get your people to go and uh, uh, and uh, go and testify against this, uh, this person. So, you know, it took him around like 45 to uh, uh, 50 minutes to get there, when he got there, guess what? This smuggler was released. It was released under the uh, under the charges of uh, uh, the, um, uh, disturbing the peace. I oh. think so. It was under the charges of disturbing the peace. It has nothing to do with kidnapping and smuggling. So they talked to the judge. Why you let him go? And this is the arrangements that they have going on for him to pay off the officer or for him to pay off a federal agent or for him to pay off a police officer over here. It, 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 get, it gets to money. Where did he have the connection to pay up that you know amount of money that because the charge is pretty serious. Now, after that, the, the pastor came back to his, uh, to his shelter and he received a phone call from him. He told him, Pastor, can I go and pick up my stuff? And uh, he said, yes, you can come and pick up your stuff. But this is where the pastor tells me, you know what, there's more than one. There's more than one that they were working with him. Why? Because he never came back. Why? Because he knew that they were uh, uh, police, officer, police officers over here waiting for him. So you got a kidnapper. You got a, a, a trafficking minor 
uh, and you got a person that is already, you know, they're going to put a warrant for his arrest now over here in Tijuana. And not only that, we all know that these people have the, the power to cross to the United States real easily. So where do you think he's gone to right now? The U.S.? He's not over here. He's in the U.S. Probably, you know, that's his number one thing. I need to cross the U.S. not right now emergently. So that's why I gave you the photo, Cindy, so we can, uh, you know, viralize his, his face and everybody can get to know where, you know, give. First of all, you know, come back and pay up what you did and give. You know explanations of where where are the whereabouts of these two minors that they're that they're lost they're missing one of them is 17 years old and this 17 year old has a daughter of a year and a half and he she is carrying the daughter of a year and a half and she's 17 and the other one is 14 god so we don't know about those two minors and the other seven that they were practically basically smuggled already to the united states so we're going to keep on uh, sharing those images. We have the image of the accused uh, Guatemalan smuggler uh, and the little girl that, one of the little girls that is missing right now. Here's the image of the little girl that is being sought. She is uh, now currently missing. And this is the picture of the ID of the man who has been accused of smuggling. Now, I did grab a video from Border Network News that Oscar has shared on his page uh, he's a correspondent for Border Network News. You can go there to their page, follow, like, and also you can see the video of this man. He's being filmed and people are accusing him. I will share that video after my interview with Oscar because I know that our time is short and I want to get as much information from him while I have him. But I will share that video with you so that you can see for yourselves. You're also free to go and watch it on Border Network News. Um, there were some other things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, this is incredible information that you're giving us um, this just happened today and you've been out there following what's going on with this shelter it's not really a shelter you told me it's being a home that is being rented right next to the border wall can you talk about that uh, shelter not shelter well you know this is this is a thing that, that that is really ridiculous they already know that international pact of immigration law says that they have to be a stay, uh, they have to be away at 30 mile radius. Now, this shelter is called a uh, shelter, uh, so called, it's called uh, uh, the migrant embassy. And what was before the migrant embassy, it was, it, it, this is a private property. It's not, a, you know, it's not a, 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 a property that it was uh, bought by this company or they try to build up a shelter. No, it's a private property. And this person that is a, that is a she, this person, uh, you know, owns the private property, owns her property. And before, you know, all this caravan came, started coming in, she was helping immigrants to stay over there and sleep and eat and whatever, you know, all those things. Mm -hmm. So right now, the, all the caravan came in, uh, all of a sudden it became the, uh, the migrant embassy shelter. Mm -hmm. And this is really funny. Why? Because the big rumor is that it's being rented by a couple organizations they are paying off the owner as a private property so when the government went over there to check the permissions to check the permits to check you know every single document that you know uh, uh, buys that you are uh, uh that you are uh, uh, a Approved. legitimate shelter yeah the, a legitimate shelter that you are a legitimate shelter they didn't have anything what they said was this is not a shelter. It's a home. I can put whatever people I can in this house. You don't have the authority to come over here. You don't have the authority to cross over here. Yeah, but it says em a migrant embassy shelter on the on, on outside. I can put whatever I want. I don't have proof of being a shelter. Just people coming over here and sleep. They have around 175 to 200 people in that house sleeping on the floor and sleeping on bunk beds. Now, the other thing is that you know, the rumor is that who's paying for this property because it's a gigantic property. And on the side of the property, you got angels without borders on the side of the property. So who works with angels without borders? All these organizations from America, 
rapid response, caravan support network, and border support network. All these three, they work with angels without borders. So who's paying for this house that is being rented with all these immigrants? And it's just on Jump Street. They just go outside. We test, we were, you know, a testimony of a person that literally in front of us around 10 o'clock late at night, 11 o'clock at night, uh, my partner Anthony Alwetter, Mr. Ben Berquan, we were filming the border as there were a lot of movement. There was a lot of movement. It's a mafia right there. you got people on top of the pier. you got people down at the pier. you got people way behind the pier. And they're communicating with good cell phones, by the way, my I, my I add at. They are communicating with all this, you know, there's a lot of movement going on. And and in this particular moment that we were walking around and checking every single part of the fence, a guy just, you know, jumped and he climbed the fence and he jumped to the other side. All these situations that this shelter is provoking for all these other people to cross illegally to the United States. So the, the person or the organization's, the, they're paying for this shelter. We already know who they are. We, this, this, there's no way other place to look at. This is, is this organization from America. This private owner is getting paid off, and he's getting paid off real good because it's a big shelter. That rent probably is between the fifteen hundred and the two thousand dollars per month. And this organization, they don't care. They pay off a lot, and you see a lot of them. Americans over there filming, a lot of Americans over there taking photographs, a lot of these lefties over there by the fence, encouraging them and telling them, hey, you can cross, you can do whatever the hell you want, claim asylum, claim asylum. This shelter is not a shelter, Cindy, it's just a house that it says shelter outside. So how do they circumvent the laws of Mexico? Because you have rules there for legitimate shelters. There cannot be shelters that are that close to the border wall. So these people are jumping over those rules, circumventing those rules by simply calling it a rented house. Yes. You know, this is the thing. And this is the disgusting thing about these lawyers that they're coming from the U.S. They know all these loopholes in, in the law and immigration law in the United States. And not only that, they study now real good all the loopholes in immigration laws in Mexico. So they know if they are going to be registered, uh, being uh, a shelter is going to be registered as a shelter, they need all these permits and all these, and all these uh, things that they need to be a legitimate shelter. They don't want that. They just want a house to put people so they can cross illegally. Who's funding a shelter is being funded by the government. They give, you know, the municipal government. They give them, you know, specific amount of money every month to fund them. Now, this house, they're not asking for help for the government. They're saying they don't need the government. They don't need nobody. They can fund it on their own self. So it's practically a house that they're renting, and they're just putting a lot of people in there. It's just, you know, you can't go against that because there's a private property. So the government is, you know, with their hands tied, and the law officers are with their hands tied. Why? Because they can't go in there. They don't know if they're bringing in drugs. They're taking out drugs. If there's, you know, uh, criminals there, there's not. It's a private house. They can't go in there. I tried knocking one time, and the guy was, like, screaming at me, you can't come in here. I was like, I need to get an interview with somebody. Go with the Angels Without Borders. This is our next neighbor. This is a private property, and it's packed, oh. and it's full over there. You know, so it's impossible to get in there, and it's impossible to arrest somebody, and it's impossible to, you know, to uh, ask them for permits and ask them for registrations or ask them for something because it's not a shelter. They're exploiting... They're definitely exploiting loopholes. Um, and I, I wanted to get your opinion. I asked you about this earlier. Uh, why so many people are crossing at Playas de Tijuana right now? Why there's this increase in border breaches? When we know many of the people that are crossing into the United States are caught right away by the Border Patrol. And you had an astonishing response to that. Do you want to share what your thoughts are on that and also about the saturation of our American court system? Yeah, that's that's what they're doing, Cindy. They're basically, you know, now 
the immigration laws in the United States are so easy to break that they know already that they don't have the necessity to run through a mountain. They only can cross, jump, and claim asylum. And that way, the, the, the United States government needs to take them to a courthouse or to an ICE facility, hold them there, and wait for a court date. Now, what they're doing, because a lot of people are waiting for numbers. I was there two days ago, uh, uh, I believe yesterday. I was there yesterday where they have a little tent and they start giving up numbers for their asylum court date. Now, they only give only one or two per month. Imagine that, one or two per month and you got more than 8,000 or more than 10,000 waiting. That is ridiculous. And why they only give one or two per month? Because the courts in the United States are flooded. Are flooded with who? Are flooded with immigrants that they're only flooding the system with claiming the asylum. They claim the asylum. Now the court is flooded. Now they have to they have to take care of first the people that are asylum seekers that they're crossing illegally and they're just lifting their hands and they're claiming asylum. And all the people that they're waiting on their court date, that it's backing up. That's why the movement is so slow. Why? That's why they get so desperate. That's why sometimes they cross illegally and they claim the asylum. A lot of people, you know, they're being coached this way so they can wait. They're going to get desperate and they're going to listen. These lawyers tell them that, you know, they, you need to you need to wait. And so they make them so desperate. These lawyers, they know psychologically how they're going to get in their brain. So they are, you know, mentally drained and they're getting it's so desperate that they're going to be like, you know, I'll go. I'll go and claim the asylum now. I didn't want to do it that way. I wanted to cross legally and wait for a number. But because the court date is too flooded and I'm waiting over here two, three, four, five, six months, i uh, hell with it. I'm just going to jump and claim the asylum. And that's, you know, that's the number the reason why all these lawyers, as soon as they cross over there, they get all these foundations, mm. all these funds mm. they start with you know you got maria you got juan poor little maria and juan they just cross and claim asylum for me to help you out uh and for me to help them out it's going to have a reach of ten thousand dollars and you get all these people there are like this in america donating and donating and donating with their eyes wide shut and not even they surpass they not even they reach the ten thousand they surpass the ten thousand and then they go back to the immigrants and they say, I can't do anything about it. So where are those $10,000 at? They're making a lot of money, a lot of money of immigrants. These lawyers are making a lot of money with immigrants. And not only that, and they're making fake marriages. They are falsifi uh, falsificating uh, certificates of marriage. They are, you know, working. Of, if you're an MS-18 and, and there's a woman that qualifies, but you don't qualify. If you get married, they qualify. They're doing all these disgusting stuff to make a loophole to violate the immigration law in the United States and cross legally to claim asylum. They are really breaking the law. They should be charged with treason. They should be charged with a federal crime. These people are disgustingly awful, Cindy. They are using immigrants. They are using them, basically using them as bait for they can collect the dollar. And it's really unfortunate because what it does to our American immigration system, the, the, the legal system that people have been in waiting in line now for years is to clog up the system and make it impossible for those people to do things correctly and in a timely fashion. It's making everyone else that was already in line have to wait longer. We only have five more minutes with you, Oscar, and I really wanted to ask you about your recent encounters with Antifa. Uh, you're having problems in Tijuana. You guys are <laughs> full of Antifa again. What's going on? Uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday. I'm so tired. I, I, I was so tired. I don't know if it was yesterday <laughs> or uh, two days before. I'm sorry. I think that it was yesterday. Um, we, uh, we were about to do a live video over there. Mr. Ben Berkwam and the whole team was about to do a live video. And, uh, what we encountered was that early in the morning, 
there's this tent that Protection of Migrants puts to give the number for the political asylum. It was packed. It was absolutely packed with immigrants. Now, in those little uh, uh, groups of immigrants, there were a lot of Americans with notebooks, and they were writing on them. So I approach a lot of them and tell them, what are you doing over here? Mm -hmm. They're like, I don't need to give you an explanation to you. I'm a Mexican citizen. I'm in my territory. You're in my country. You're violating my laws because you're practicing law. No, I'm not. I'm just a volunteer. <laughs> what are you doing volunteering in a line with an immigration uh, political asylum form? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you doing over there? What kind of volunteer work is that? <laughs> they are so really so stupid oh, that they God. think that we don't know. And after that, we started walking and we encounter two Antifa. One of them, I told him, what are you doing over here? And my partner, Anthony, confronted them and they and he told him, we know what you're doing. We know why, why are you here in Tijuana? They were uh, uh, walking with two uh, from members from the LGTV, I think they're called. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were they were taking them to some other place. Now we encounter another two. They, they were walking to the taxi and they were surrounding us, walking around us. And we, you know, we confronted them and the taxi. And we told them, we know what you're doing. Get out. Now we went to another space that is uh, underneath the bridge. It's a little, it was a little bar. Now it's a, it's the headquarters for all these groups from in organizations from America. It's headquarters. The bar used to be called Las Caguamas, so it's it's uh, it, it's like a forty ouncer of uh, of liquor. It used to be called Las Caguamas. This little part, it's packed with Americans in there who give legal advice, who get medical care for from doctors from America, hmm. and they get coach right there. How to ask for the political asylum? There's like this, Antifa, like wow. this. But the good thing that I saw and the good thing that I felt is that immediately when we were confronting them, they went away. So okay. they know that they're violating the law. They know that they're committing a federal crime. They know that they can't practice law in, the, in Mexico. They know that. I don't care about the whole articles that they started bringing because I, I've been getting messages from them. Uh, you know, they, they, you don't even know law. You don't know this. You don't know the Constitution. I know my constitutional rights, and I know the Constitution over here. And you can't be practicing law if you're not registered in my country. And they're doing that. Mm -hmm. And we encounter a lot of a lot of Antifa movement. There was a lot of Antifa movement in there, or a lot of uh, activists, radical activists in there. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how this organization from Mexico, Protection of Migrants, they, pro that's the word, protection. They protect them so bad that they told my partner, Anthony Aguero, you can't be recording them. I was so mad that what? I went over there. I went over, I started recording him. He looked at me and I looked at him and he, I told him, you don't even have the decency of telling me that I cannot record. He went away. And he, I Probably he, he saw that he was American. And so that's why, you know, they told him you can't be recording. But to me, he didn't say anything. The reason why is because I was all up, all up in his face. The thing is that they protect him so much and they protect the Antifa and they protect all these activists because Mexican citizens are not doing anything. Well, they don't care about what's going on. That's, that's only true of some Mexican citizens because you are doing something. And I am very happy that you are able to report that these people, these activists, they know you're on to them. They know that you're watching and they know that you're going to continue to question their activities in Mexico. And that, that gives me hope because I think that they know that they're not going to continue to get away with this. And if they are conscious of the fact that you're going to be there every day, following their activities, I think that might give them pause in the future. My whole purpose is to get them out of there, to get them out of the border, 
and to expose every day. And I can record and be freely. If you're listening to me and if you're an infiltrated Antifa, an old infiltrated BAM or an infiltrated rapid response, I will see you over here in Tijuana. If you want to confront me, I will be right there. And I will be defending the Tijuana citizens. I will be defending my country. I will be defending my constitution. And I will also be defending my neighbor that is the United States. Go back to your country. Go be an activist, a positive activist over there in your country. Try to defend the 350,000 homeless veterans that you got over there. Help those people. Don't come over here. Don't instigate. Don't motivate. Don't come over here and cause problems. Don't come over here and, co and help people that they're not even from your country. Don't come over here and cause more drama than we already have. I, it's my obligation as a citizen, Cindy, to defend my country, to defend my city, and get them out. And it, I am going to do it. I am so dedicated to this that I am going to be every day recording them. And every day I'm going to give them hell. They are going to go back to their country. I don't want them here. Well, thank you for bringing us this update. I really appreciate uh, having these updates from you on a regular basis because there's so much going on right across the border that most Americans don't get to hear about, like the news that you brought us today about the human smuggler. And I hope you'll be back next week to give us another update. Uh, I know you've got to run, but is there anything else that you want to uh, tell people about Border Network News, about your work, or about what you're uh, reporting on currently? Oh, you know, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to you and Duke. I'm so sorry for the American audience and people from Minnesota. I am so sorry. <laughs> I, my Skype, uh, my Microsoft, I don't know what happened. Uh, next time I will, I will, you know, it's a compromise for myself and I will give you my word. Then my phone will be functioning well. <laughs> follow me, people. Follow Border Network, ne Border, Border Network News with my partner, Anthony Aguero. You can follow Anthony Aguero as a conservative Anthony in Instagram and in Facebook. And you can follow me as Oscar Blue. Follow also Cindy and Duke. Cindy, you know, a Mexican crossing lines. Uh, great, great, great uh, uh, program. Uh, follow them. And, you know, people, you know, uh, it's about time to be radical in a positive way. It's about time. We are losing this fight. We are losing this fight. And if we don't do anything about it, you are going to lose America. And me, I am already losing my country. So we need to stand up and fight for our children, for our grandchildren, and for the future of, you know, not only America, but for the future of the world. Thank you so much, Oscar. I really appreciate your time. Say hello to your family and have a great night. Too, Cindy. Thank you so much and say hello to Duke. That's my man. That's my man right there. Man. <laughs> say hi. Say bye, Duke. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Really appreciate you being on. <laughs> and we'll do really well the next time. Thank you so much for giving us the information Thank you. that you Thank have. you, guys. Thank you. Good night. Okay, folks. Well, that was Oscar El Blue Ramirez here on KPPPLP. It's always great to have him. His updates are so uh, incredible. I mean, the news, what he's experiencing out there day by day. Um, I mean, w we already knew that there was smuggling going on on the regular. But um, to find out this new story, I really want to get to the bottom of how this guy was operating. And I know that we'll be getting more updates, more details, mm -hmm. but as promised, I am going <clears throat> to put my headphones on, play oh, yeah. the video from Border Network News, and as best as I can translate uh, what's happening. So if you just joined us, here's what Mr. Uh, Ramirez just reported. He said he received a text from the pastor of Agape Shelter, same pastor I interviewed here on a Mexican crossing lines. The pastor said that one of the people working security at the shelter, a Guatemalan uh, immigrant himself, was working to uh, smuggle people into Mexico. And that when he came back to the shelter, the complaints that were made to the pastor were being made by the people of the shelter while the pastor filmed the encounter and that's what you're about to hear a clip a piece he didn't film from beginning to end of this encounter obviously so this is all i have and this is available on border network news um 
the clip again is going to be showing a man sitting in a chair. He's drinking, uh, looks like a soda pop. And um, he's being confronted by women and other people that are in the room, migrants that are in the room for smuggling people, including children. Here's that tape. We said, don't go, because if you guys are going to go, I'm going to have to call the cops, because they're going to have to take the Guatemalan. And at that moment, they called him, they'd seen him, and they said, we're waiting for him. They called the, the, the Guatemalan. They didn't, he didn't come in because he knew we were here, so he came through another way. They told him that we were going to call the police and there was some young people that were with her too and one of them got away too another one got away so she got the phone and she called him and this girl comes and says goodbye to me and I said please don't do this don't leave you guys are minors and this is a crime because you're minors it's a crime so I know they called him and told him so where did you take the children look pastor like the sister just said in front of God what they're saying some of it is real some of it is a lie okay okay, okay hold on they're, they're saying that you took the hold on, hold on calm down they're saying that you you were in agreement with this little girl and that she was saying that you guys were going to take her I don't know what part of that is not real what part of that's not real well let's start with what she says first she as she said, when I said, yes, you know, I was talking to Sergio, and they talked to Sergio, and that the Guatemalan is, is, is not uh, being respectful to the women. That's where it cuts off, folks. What wow. did you think of that, Duke? You've heard it a couple times. Yeah, so, so that's the, the guy who um, was on the, the photo of the... Um, yeah, you can show the photo if you want while you talk about it. You know, I wish I wish there was more because he's he, that guy's saying what they're saying is it's a lie. You know, it is, they're not they're saying something they're true or not, and that's Pastor uh, Alberto in the background, right? Asking, he's the one yeah, holding the phone. <clears throat> he's asking him the questions directly. Mm -hmm. I thought that was that was that was really good. You know, and it's just um, this is the guy right yep, here. Yeah, that's the guy. And and by the way, that's the guy that you just saw on screen. That's his his name and his ID information. Uh, this was uh, shared with me by Oscar, who, who's reporting this tonight. Just happened. This just occurred. Wow. Um, this is something that seems to happen quite frequently. It's, mm -hmm. it's really disturbing because, I, I don't know, I guess people can't read body language through the radio, but how yeah. did you feel about the way that, I mean, I know you don't even understand him, but he wouldn't look people in the eyes. He's talking to the pastors like, Look, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. He I, said, "Where did you take the kids?" I, yeah, and I thought his body language was like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, like he's not facing any authority right, right. there. Right. He's basically above any authority that's around him in right. that environment he's in. So his body language was, "This is not serious. I don't have to really listen to anybody here. I don't know why the guy is still there." You know, but um, you know, he's getting confronted right now. I don't know what's happened since then, but his demeanor was like. This is not a serious matter for me. You're barking up the wrong tree, and you have misinformation. So what the what Oscar reported tonight was that he was arrested. Really? But he was not charged with smuggling. He was not charged with the disappearance of the minor, the girl's picture that I shared with you. If you could please put that picture up again, Duke, so that people can uh, make this viral, folks, so that people can see. Uh, this is the idea of the person that's being accused of smuggling he was released after he was arrested for disorderly conduct that's all he was charged with duke mm -hmm. i don't know if they didn't have enough time to mount an investigation against him before he was bailed out but he was not held and it was very frustrating to oscar i could tell when he was telling mm -hmm. the story that this guy was let loose because you know the pastor called the federal authorities and reported this and they were kind of staked out waiting for him to come back 
he already knew pastor already knew he was going to come back because this guy called him on the phone and said can i come back to the shelter to get my things Mm -hmm. after he was released from jail wow and that's how they knew he was released from jail and so the federal authorities were already waiting for him and he never came which is why oscar says he believes that this guy was working with other people or had other people on the inside of that shelter that in you know tipped him off yeah told him or or that it that were surrounding the shelter that were saying hey don't come down here because there's cops waiting for you but this is the little girl this is the only uh image we have of some of the kids that were that left with him he took 10 people folks wow 10 people among them were two i i believe that's correct i believe there were two uh minors amongst the people that this guy was gonna smuggle okay this is very disturbing and then of course he told us about this house this building if you go to border network news you can see the videos where they're were showing it like they literally show you the wall that's facing the ocean yeah and then they turn the phone a little bit and it's like and there's the shelter mm-hmm. the mic it was called the uh, ambassador and Im- Embajada de los Migrantes, like the embassy, the migrant embassy. That's it's the name. Okay, the translation. Right. Um, what they're doing is they're circumventing the law in Tijuana because there's a law. If you run a shelter in the country and it's properly licensed, it cannot be anywhere near the border to prevent human smuggling, illegal crossings, shutting down the border, all of the things Tijuana has been fighting ever since this migrant caravan. Uh, the first one that was this b- massive one in October of 2017 uh, showed up in Playas de Tijuana. Hmm. And now it's just out in the open. They're, they're literally running this shelter. They answer to no one. It's just like this guy. They like have this like attitude like, we don't got to talk to <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> exactly. We, this is a private house. Get off my property. <coughs> yeah. And they can't, they're getting away with it. It's crazy. Well, it is. Um, and then of course, uh, he believes that, you know, because the border angels are right next door, he was told, go talk to the border angels next door. Like, what are they? The spokespeople for the people running this I guess. house shelter, shelter, not shelter. That's what I called it in my, uh, lead into our show, the shelter, not shelter. Cause supposedly it's not a shelter, but it's functioning as a shelter mm-hmm. and they've got a hundred and some people. Wow. I mean, th- this facility must be huge. Mm-hmm. I saw a bunch of pictures of a house where they said that they out they had all these bunk beds, and I was just thinking it was flashing into the images of the bunk beds when I heard Oscar talk about that because I've seen images of beds where they said it's for the t- they're housing all these unaccompanied minors. You have heard Lolly B and Jake Lee and these caravan support network, border support network activists talking incessantly about about these unaccompanied minors on my show yesterday i showed you that a staffer for congresswoman barragan the congresswoman that played got you with um kirsten nielsen of department of Mm -hmm. homeland security um she is one of those activists that is in the whatsapp chats that pastor albert rivera shared with me following my interview with him about the kidnapping of carlos the uh, unaccompanied minor that was taken by these caravan support network uh, activists. I showed you the conversations in which they discuss the taking of the boy and how they, even amongst the activists in this WhatsApp chat, do not agree with the tactics being used by some of the people from the border support network hashtag, or, you know, uh, slash uh, caravan support network. So uh, Antifa is out and proud. Act, mm-hmm. they're 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 taking over the city you know he held his fingers up yeah. like this this is a way of saying like we're you know fed up fe- you know we're full we have no more room okay in, in, okay in mexican sign language <clears throat> if you do this there's like it's like this it's like that yeah if you do that sign it means like mm-hmm. you're full to the brim with antifa <laughs> uh, okay so um for those of you who are wondering what what's that sign it means <laughs> They're everywhere. It's a, it's an invasion yeah. of Antifa anarchists in Tijuana, Mexico. And I feel sorry for them. We had those same protesters here 
for over a year exactly in north dakota mm-hmm. i feel your pain tijuana i have been investigating these activists and how they do what their modus operandi is a lot of it is violence a lot of it is breaking the law um and it is not unusual to see them involving drugs it is not unusual for those drugs to be distributed among the so-called, you know, people that they're so supposedly protecting. Mm-hmm. And in this case, that means people in the caravan, including unaccompanied minors, were being doped up by the Caravan Support Network activists. That's the allegations of Pastor Rivera. That's what he said he witnessed and that that unaccompanied minor told him. Uh, I have the article in which I talk about this at length and it shares the links. You can see the pictures and all the information, not only about that, but also about the documentation of the fake marriages. You heard uh, Oscar talk about that. I documented it in this article that I did on ToriSays.com. We'll put that in the comments of the show so that you can go and read it there. But I also want to tell you tonight that I found I shouldn't say I found yeah. I know who the woman is that Paloma for Trump was talking about the video that I showed you in my show yesterday was talking to Maria Mesa the Honduran woman that is famous now because she appeared in the pictures running with her two kids in a you know a cloud of tear gas you remember that picture? Oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. That when the, the hundreds right. of people rushed the border. Yeah, very iconic picture, yeah. Yes. That lady, as I have told you, many of the people that were staying in the street in front of the shelter Benito Juarez, was one of the resistors. They were not really caravan migrants. They were protesters working with the Antifa and mm. uh, ac- you know anarchists uh, connected activists from the United States. Wow. That's what they are. That's what they were. That's why they didn't accept help from anyone, even though they were accepting donations, even though they were accepting food, even though some of that food, some of that help, some of those donations, some of that support came from people like Padre Solalinde, came from Mexicans like, you know, Senador Hector Bonilla, came from the people in Tijuana like Oscar El Blue Ramirez because they have compassion, because they want to make sure that people uh, are cared for, because they have... Uh, compassion and care for the migrants that come through that city that go through Mexico and always have had. So the fact that those people that were staying in the street and that later some of them went into that shelter, Viento y Marea, the, the way they were talking about the Mexican people and the Mexican authorities and the federal police, and even, you know, they turned on the priest, the uh, Father Solarín, they, they turned on everybody that helped them, was disgusting to me because they were literally biting the hand that fed them while they were trying to say uh, to the faces of the Mexican people, hey, uh, thank you for helping us, but also let me bite that hand. Mm -hmm. And in the American media, all of these people, from uh, Chudi to the Al Otro Lado ladies, the lawyers from Al Otro Lado, to the people involved in the uh, Rapid Response Network of San Diego, from the people that are in Minority Humanitarian Foundation, Bridges of Love Across Borders, Caravan Support Network, they all have the same story. Mexicans are xenophobic. Mexicans are transphobic. Mexicans are homophobic. Mexicans hate the migrant caravans. Mexicans are all nationalists. And you know what? I'm not saying that there aren't people that are. Mm -hmm. And what in the hell would be wrong with someone in Mexico caring about the sovereignty of their nation? I don't see anything wrong with that. What's really, uh, you know, the propaganda part of it all is that they are lying because the truth is that the Mexican government, the Mexican authorities, and the Mexican people, by and large, even nationalists like Oscar El Blue, went out there and helped the migrant caravan. Even the ones that were resisting in the streets and pooing and peeing in the streets and closing down commerce in the, in mm-hmm. the street, they even went down there and helped them. Even then, they went and helped them. So for them to have the audacity in the American media to say 
Mexico is not helping them. The government is not helping them. I showed you how that Chudi woman was posting al otro lado's complaints about oh, yeah. the Grupo Beta. That's the enforcement arm of immigration in Mexico. It would be the equivalent of ICE in Mexico. And they're saying ICE is telling people that we're not real lawyers or that we're giving bad advice and that what we're doing is illegal and they're telling people not to talk to us. And Chudi, Sofia Maria de Loreto Chudi, the intern, uh, staffer, uh, worker for Congresswoman Nanette Barragan, posted she was effing fuming on her page and her mom immediately tagged Senator Wyden and they tag Jeff Merkley. The same Jeff Merkley that just went to the Agape Shelter. Anybody else paying attention to the Agape Shelter? Because I got my eyes on the Agape Shelter right now, everybody. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff going on. And that's why I have people like this pastor and Oscar El Blue on my show. So they can tell you what's going on up to date, up to the minute. But y'all sent me pictures of this woman. I knew I'd seen her before, Duke. I told you she looks hella familiar. Look at this. Well, who is she? It's because we'd already shown her on our show before yeah. when we were talking about Minority Humanitarian Foundation and Mark Lane. Okay. Her name is Paola Mendoza. Paola Mendoza. Here is a post by Mark Lane of Minority Humanitarian Foundation where she's where he's talking about what they're doing in connection <coughs> with um, some of the migrants that they're crossing into the United States. On this occasion, I believe it was a group that included the girl Leslie that was in the wheelchair okay. that suffered from cerebral palsy. Mm. It says, wish us luck working with the A-team, Paola Mendoza, who is one of the founders of the Women's March trying to get Leslie and her father processed into the United States. And who does she tag? Bertie Gutierrez of Bridges of Love Across Border, Shane, Zoe Winkler, the daughter of Henry Winkler, mm -hmm. and Humanity, uh, what is it called? They have a similar organization. Yeah, some humanitarian, hum something or other. Humanity is us. We are humanity. Okay, yeah. This is humanity. This That's is, it. It's humanity. Yes. Oh, my God. There's so many similar names to all of these um mm -hmm. <clears throat> organizations that are exploiting the caravan, making a bank, making cha-ching yep. after cha-ching. And then, of course, there's a bunch of other people, including the reporter, Ari Hornarvar. Okay. She shows up again and again. There's James Alaya, one of the people that runs Minority Humanitarian Foundation and also tagged is Julie. Uh, Julie Peter Canelli and Julie. I don't know if that's the same Jules yeah, that the, is from their page. The Julie without a last name. Julie without a last name. But I will tell you this. Julie without a last name uh, wasn't without a last name. Her name was Kramer on the Minority Humanitarian Staff Team page. Okay. And James Alaya appeared on that staff team page when I last showed you that show. You know I know? Because I went back to that show about Mark Lane and Minority mm -hmm. Humanitarian Foundation. And I was like... Oh, yeah. What was the name of that Jules chick? Let me go back to their website and look at it. Guess what? They took her last name off of there. <laughs> she don't have a last name on the page <clears throat> no more. And guess what? James Elia ain't on there either. Hmm. He's hiding under a rock somewhere. I don't know wow. where he went, but he's he's gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here is another photo uh, of the um, immigrant defenders. Oh, there's oh, go back to that other picture. That's her, by the way. Okay. That's this is the picture attached to the post we just show you. Mm -hmm. That's her. I knew I recognized her. Yeah, she I was the her. skinny little lady that was with the little bun on her head that, that Paloma confronted and said yeah. when, after talk after she talked to the lady, <clears throat> the Maria lady with the tear gas babies. Yeah. She's like, wait a minute. I translated what Paloma had in that clip where mm -hmm. she tells her, you heard it from the woman's mouth, not Paloma's mouth. The woman Maria says. She told me to give me her number. She'll meet us on the other side. Yeah. And, you know, they were making arrangements. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they were making arrangements. So Paloma goes and questions her. Hey, did you just tell her to cross into the United States illegally? And she's like, no. Who are you? And then she tried to cover up her face. 
I don't know why you're trying to cover up your face, girl. You an actress. <laughs> She's an actress from Colombia, just like Sam Slovic. Oh yeah. She was late. The latest thing she was in was a documentary film uh, called Entre Nos, Between Us. Okay. And it was about uh, her mom's story of coming into the United States. Uh, trying to uh, undocumented with her and her little brother in tow uh, to try to find to reunite with their dad who when uh, when they reunited with him abandoned them Hmm. and you know what what that was like for her and her immigrant family her immigrant family story is the story she starred in as her own as her mom she starred as her mom in the movie about herself it was (laughs) was a little bit weird yeah um I don't know what other uh, things she's done. I'm going to take a deeper dive into that rabbit hole for you all later. But I just did want to, I want to tell you, I wanted to acknowledge, I want to say thank you. Thank you for all of you who, after the show, immediately sent me pictures of her and said, that's Paola Mendoza, because I forgot her name. I knew I'd seen her face, but I couldn't remember where she does kind of have a forgettable face, though, doesn't she? Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm not trying to diss her looks as a woman. I don't like that. But I'm just saying, it was kind of like so many other... Mm-hmm. It was kind of generic to me. So for a minute, I almost thought she was Nicole Ramos, but I know that woman's face. So yeah, I was like, yeah. no, that's not her. Mm-hmm. But, this, but I did recognize her. And here is one of the things she works for. It's not just the Women's March. But you know that the Women's March connection means she is connected to Linda Sarsour. Mm-hmm. You know she's connected to Linda Sarsour. And you already know that Mohammed El Nakib and Mark Lane are connected to Linda Sarsour of the Women's March. So here Mark Lane posts on December 9th, fantastic news. ICE just called and Juan Alberto and Leslie will be released at the border into the United States in one hour. I'm on my way to the border to get them now. So after two months of pushing her in a stroller from Honduras, three weeks in a refugee camp in Tijuana, four days in ICE custody, this incredible father has achieved his goal of getting his sick daughter to a safer, better place. This may be the best love story you've ever seen. Huge thanks to at Paola Mendoza. Uh And Lindsay Taz... Oh, God. Tazilowski. Okay. Tazilowski. From Immigrant Defenders Law Center. I also featured them. Remember, they were prominently featured on This Is Humanity, the group connected to Zoe Winkler and the Minority Humanitarian Foundation. And Immigrant Defenders also works with at Paola Mendoza. Guess who else they work with? Al otro lado. Yup. They all work with t- t- with each other. But of course, here is that acknowledgement in a tweet. Or no, sorry. This is Instagram. I'm getting all of my socials <laughs> confused. Yeah. But you can see in the comments there, Al otro lado actually responds to her shout out. In this tweet, she's telling people, hey... If you want to volunteer in Tijuana and help refugees from the barrack caravan, go to Al Otro Lado. She tags them and find out how you can help. I've seen Al Otro Lado at work and they are truly making a difference. Well, Paola, uh, that is debatable. <laughs> yeah. According to some sources like <clears throat> Pastor Rivera mm-hmm. um, and some of the people uh, living in Tijuana, residents of Tijuana, like Oscar Ramirez that mm-hmm. I just spoke to. But uh, we'll get back to you on that. Here, al otro lado, Instagrams back to them. Thanks for the shout out and love, Paola. Heart, heart, heart. Are those black hearts, Duke? Kind of look like it, don't they? Yeah, because there's a rose at the end of this uh, message and and it's red. But those hearts are black. Hmm. This is three black hearts. <clears throat> and then they say, we appreciate you. That was weird. <laughs> Is that yeah. just weird to me? Yeah. Okay, and finally, I wanted to show you that um, here is an Instagram video that she did on the uh, emergency declaration by the president about, and get this, she's working 
in tandem with the groups that have folks uh, that are associated with the caravan that are kidnapping children from the Agape shelter, as alleged by the pastor, yep. giving drugs to the migrants, as alleged by the pastor and the child that they kidnapped from his shelter. Here is a second video posted by the pastor given by to Border Network News of more allegations of human smuggling and people being kidnapped and disappeared. And we have fake marriages by people involved with these organizations and groups, including the lawyers' groups. And evidence handed over to our station and to Border Network News. Now I ask you, what do you think of this woman's post about the state of emergency? She denies exists, but she is helping to create. <laughs> yeah. Take a look. Here's her post. And here's the video. This is what she says. Let's be clear about this fake state of emergency that's going to be announced tonight. There is no state of emergency at our southern border. In fact, uh, illegal immigration has dropped consistently since the year 2000. This is, there is a crisis at the border and it is a manufactured crisis by Donald Trump. There are hundreds, almost thousands of people waiting to apply for asylum at our border. And the reason they are waiting is because Donald Trump has changed the ways in which you apply for asylum in this country. He even has a term for it. It's called metering. Metering, like as if they are parking their car at a meter. That is what he calls this process that he has created. And the reality is that 75% of Americans oppose closing the government over a wall. Huh. Interesting. Guess what else she posted about? She posted about Enclave Caracol. Check it out. She posted, hey, everybody, why don't you give to Enclave Caracol a place we just talked to um, uh, Oscar about. Saying, you know, they've got these uh, people, those these lawyers out there. The pastor also told us about that. And in Clave Caracol, and they're constantly giving advice. This is her post, raising money for in Clave Caracol. And she says, to volunteer in Tijuana, go to in Clave Caracol. And she's also concerned about the leaked documents. The leaked documents that were recently being investigated in the media. Okay. If you'd like to go to the next slide there, you can see the leaked documents post in which she talks about uh, how she's concerned about it. This is what she says uh, after m she posts Matt Pierce's scoop on the NBC San Diego reports about the secret database of activists and journalists and social media influencers. And her response is to say... We will not be intimidated. We is a lot of people that doesn't yeah. include me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. I'm not on that list. But she's like, we. Like, do you know something we don't know? Mm -hmm. Maybe she knows she's on the list or her friends are on the list. Maybe. She knows Nicole Ramos. And mm -hmm. she knows Nicole Ramos is on that list. Mm -hmm. But it says... We will not be intimidated. We will continue our work no matter what Trump and his cronies throw our way. They are trying to silence us because they are scared. Mm, I don't know about that. I think they may be uh, trying to investigate some crime. Yep. She goes on. My people keep telling the truth. Keep organizing. Keep fighting. So... It, do you notice how all of these people that are associated with the Caravan Support Network are very concerned about that government list being yeah. investigated? Because they're all on it. Yes, <laughs> no. <clears throat> she also knew about Javi's mom. Oh. She also posted about Javi's mom on her Instagram. How did Minority Humanitarian Foundation Birdie love of cross borders? Blah blah. How did all of these people end up with the same people? How did they end up taking pictures of Leslie and her dad, the woman, the girl in the uh, thing? How did they How did they know? They just knew. And um, they also had the little girl with cerebral palsy. Paola put her on her Instagram too. Hmm. I haven't even started to shred through the social media accounts of this woman. Um, if y'all want to out there to help me, screenshot, download videos, get the information. I'm going to be taking a deeper dive on this Paola woman, and I'm going to try to help investigate what's going on with the Agape Shelter smuggler. Mm -hmm. Where did he go? Yeah, exactly. What happened to him? Why isn't he in jail? 
And I will be bringing you more updates from Border Network News next week with Oscar El Blue Ramirez. Hopefully, God willing. Thank you for being here on a Mexican Crossing Lines with your host, Cindy Gomez Shep. And with Duke Gomez Shep. You've been listening to 88.1 FM, KPPPLP Fargo Moorhead, where we are adding local color to your airwaves. And oh, I forgot one last thing. Yeah, this that? is important. An article that was written about me, it's in Spanish. I know oh, yes. most of you won't be able to read it. But you can do a Google uh, just it's it's really done well in English if you just do the Google Translate. You read it in English, didn't you? Yeah, and I you, sure did. I and it was, pretty, it was pretty it was pretty easy to read. I thought so. This is an article that was written about me, about my work, about my investigations. It's called Cindy Gomez Shemp and the Truth About the Caravans. I encourage you all to take a take a look at it and share it out. Uh, I'm really proud of the work that I've been doing investigating these fake activists and these uh, these people that are just causing a lot of problems for Mexico and America at this time with their coverage or with their work with the caravans. Stay tuned to a Mexican Crossing Lines here on 88.1 FM KPPPLP. Thank you for being with us and good night. <laughs>